ברוכים הבאים רבותיי, welcome to another edition of our Thursday night class, we are studying פרשת בו. הפרשה begins with משה רבנו going to פרעה, introducing the seventh plague. Actually, the eighth plague. הרבה חושך, מכת בכורות. ויאמר השם אל משה בו אל פרעה, בו is three, בית א', that hints to us that these are the introduction of the last three plagues. כי אני הכבדתי את ליבו ואת לב עבדיו, I hardened his heart. The reason I did that is למען שתי אותותי אלה בקרבו, so I can place more מכות, I'm not done with him. If I was done with him, he would have let you out after dam. But I want him to suffer ten מכות. So I'm going to harden his heart in order to bring a few more מכות. I still have some, uh, some work to do. ולמען תספר באוזני בנך ובן בנך. And there's another reason. In order that you'll be able to retell the story to the children and to the grandchildren the way I belittled the Egyptians the word it means how God made fun of the Egyptians or derided them it's not enough just to tell over the story of Yisiat Mitzrayim the Pasuk is telling us a very important condition, how the story must be told over. God wants the making fun of Paro and the Egyptians. That's essential. Not just to tell them the facts. They went in, there was dam, and everything turned into blood, and they drank it, and they bought, they bought uh, uh, water from the Jewish people. And not to get into the details with the frogs and the lice. Of course, you have to know the story, but the way to tell over the story has to be in a way of it alalti, you have to show your children and your grandchildren that I made a joke of the Egyptians. In Hebrew we say, letanut. Uh, How does this manifest itself? How do you put this very important detail of the halakha into practice? So we must now look at the story of Egypt through the eyes of it alalti. We need to see where Paro was made to be looked like a fool. Not just that he was beaten with makot. But Eulam punishes many Rishaim. But it's the obligation of the reader to see where the hit'alalti was, where the derision is. The Pasuk says in Tehilim, Yoshev, Yoshev Bashamayim Yitzhak, Adonai Yilag Lamo. Yoshev Bashamayim, the one that sits in Shamayim, but Olam Yishak, he laughs. When he's playing with the Rishaim, it's, uh, it's fun, Kibayachon. He's laughing. The way he's spinning them this way and the other way. Hashem Yilag Lamo. Yilag means he derides them, he belittles them, he lowers them. Lag, Lag Vakilis. So where do you see the Eta Shedet Alalti? So I'll give you the most obvious, which is the starting point of the shi'ud, which everybody knows, and then we go to other examples. But we always must start from the, the basic level. Paro makes a decree. That all the children that are born must be thrown into the Nile. Now this was a reaction to something that Paro saw in the stars. Paro was a master astrologer. You have to give him credit for that. He read the stars good. The stars don't lie. And he saw in the Kochavim that the Jewish Savior, Moshi'an Shil Yisrael, the Savior is going to be born. So he has an idea. Not only did he see he's going to be born, but he's going to die by the water. So he has the, the whole story in front of him. So he has a plan. Any child that's born from today on, we take him 
and we drown them in the water. This was a very thought out plan, and but all put a lot of uh, energy into executing it. How do I know he put energy into executing it? Because Moshe Rabbeinu would be born. Actually, Moshe Rabbeinu was born three months early. So it says that Yochevet had the ability to hide Moshe for three months. Which means the police in Egypt knew every lady that was expecting, and they also knew their due date, which I don't even know if the United States government keeps records like that. We're lucky if they're able to keep a record of a birth, or the birth certificate. Even that, with all the technology and the computers, is uh, this, it's not foolproof. And here in Egypt, without any sophisticated computer system, but all put such an effort of documenting every lady's pregnancy and when they're supposed to give birth, and then once they are supposed to give birth, they get a visit from the FBI, and they come searching for the, for the baby. So she knew she had three months. So she's able to hide Moshe. Listen to what the Pasuk says. After three months, Velo yachol od hasifino. What does that mean? She could not hide him anymore. Why not? Continue hiding him. Because the system that Paro instituted was so perfect in catching every child, the Pasuk says she couldn't. She wasn't able to. You think if Yochevet had another option, she would just go throw him into the water? If the Pasuk says, Velo yachila od asifino, that means she exhausted all her options. Maybe take the baby, give it to the neighbor. Maybe put him somewhere in the field. The last thing you want to do is put the baby in the water. Because that's a certain death. The Torah is saying, Velo yachila od, that she had no options. Because Paro's system of rooting out all the Jewish boys that were born was a system that worked. <laughs> Just look at the systems we have in the United States. I didn't come here to talk against our country tonight. We could, we could spend another night doing that, Ba'azat Hashem. But uh, look at the illegal immigrants. <laughs> we put all borders and we put all systems, but with all the systems that are in place, the borders are porous. We cannot catch everyone. And here, and that's with cameras, and that's with guns, and that's with all the systems we have. And here, Paro made a system where Yochevet says, Velo oh, I have no choice. They're going to catch him. So before she gets caught, she says, I might as well just put him in the, in the water myself, because it's inevitable. She puts him in the water. Seemingly, the plan, the plan of Paro just worked. He had to do this to many, many children in order to catch the one. You see, in the stars it doesn't say Moshe Rabbeinu. It just says a Jewish boy. So he says, it's worth it to me. He doesn't care about the Jewish people. It's worth it to me to make a gezera against the whole nation in order to find the needle in the haystack. And it worked. Because eventually the system was so strong that Moshe Rabbeinu was put in the water. Only problem is, in Itzab the in Tibuna Neged Hashem. You can't outsmart God. And God always wins. And His will always overrides everything. Rabbot Mahashavot Belevish, Vatsat Adonai Takum. Happens to be at that moment, Batya goes down for a bath. She sees the basket. I shouldn't be shocked that she sees a basket. There must have been many children floating in the water. This is not the first one that's thrown in the stream. So this was a common scene at that time. But the Pasuk says, Vatamol. She had mercy. You know what that means? She had mercy. She couldn't control herself. 
God sent down a certain mercy that she had no choice but to take the baby. Even though she knew that her father said, decree, even though she knows it's illegal, and she knew the boy was Jewish, because she herself said, Mi ivrim. So she's defying her father's will. Why? Because she was taken over with such a, a, an amount of compassion, she could not control herself. Where did that compassion come from? But she could have been in a different mood that day. She could have came down and seen the baby, said, oh, leave me but I want to raise a stranger, let alone a Jew. She was raised by the biggest anti-Semite that ever lived. All of a sudden, the, the anti-Semite's daughter now has going to have Rahmanut on a Jewish boy. It, it defies all odds. If, if, you, if you were making the Havdil Bar Minnan, a movie, you wouldn't even think to write such a script. Because it says it's impossible for such a thing to happen. So she takes the baby. She takes the baby. So, okay. But Tahmol Alav. She takes the baby, she gives it to the nurse. To the Egyptian nurse. Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't want a nurse, he doesn't want to take the milk. It's not Halav Yisrael. It's Halav Ishmael, he doesn't take it. He won't eat. So all of a sudden Miriam, Miriam gets involved. Miriam comes and says, hey, Batya, you need some help. This boy over here, I think he only eats from the Jewish milk. I'll find him a, a, a nurse. Batya says, please do that and I'll pay. <laughs> All of a sudden, Miriam comes home. Ma, look what I found. Ah, there's Moshe. Where did you find him? We put him in the water. The, the king wants you to nurse, nurse him. Nurse him. I don't need the king to tell me. This is my son. And they're going to pay you $25 an hour. Moshe Rabbeinu comes back to his mother. His mother nurses him. And she gets paid for doing something she would do anyway. But look at the boomerang of Hashem. It came right back. Could this be something uh, 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 without the hand of Hashem? This is me'at Hashem ay tazotin, if not be'aneinu. Ah. After he's finished nursing, two years later, he goes to Paro's house. He's raised in Paro's palace. Ibn Ezra says, Moshe would need this training because eventually he would be leading a nation. He needs to know the protocol. He needs to know how kings behave. What's the system of government? So this was the best school he could go to. Free education by the most powerful king of the world. And Paro is training his nemesis. And Moshe is sitting on Paro's lap. And he's laughing and he's enjoying. And the Kadosh Baruch Hu in Shammai is also laughing. Yosheb Bashamai Mishak. It's a paro you abal, paro you tipesh. You tried to kill all the Jewish boys. The one you were looking for, he's on your lap. That's the, you did this whole gezerah for this one over here. And I put him right under your nose. I could have saved Moshe in many ways. It could have said in the pasuk that God told, the, that God made a miracle and the ground opened up and the Miriam and Yochevet hid Moshe Rabbeinu. Till the Gezerah was over. He could have said that also. God has many ways to save Moshe. Don't think that this was the only way. But God says, I want to save him in a way. I want to make fun of this Paro. He thinks he's such a big shot. He thinks he's so smart. He's going to make Gezerah. Because of his Gezerah, he's going to raise Moshe. Now, could you imagine? Later on, when Moshe Rabbeinu was to go into the palace, they tell Moshe Rabbeinu, Ah, no, no, Paro's not here. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I know exactly where he is. What do you think? I was raised in this palace. He knows, he goes upstairs, he makes a left turn, he makes a right turn, he opens the door. Over. But I was, hey, how did you find me? He says, what do you mean? Dad! <laughs> Don't you forget? <laughs> I, we used to play, I didn't go seek in the, in the palace. You don't remember over here? Of course I know this palace. This is my house. I was raised in this house over here. It's the also. But oh, could you imagine when he sees Moshe Rabbeinu, he's scratching his head. And I saw from Rav Shimon Shuam, he says an unbelievable point. He says, the first time when Moshe and Aharon went to Paro, it says, and Moshe was 80 years old, and Aharon was 83 years old. It gives us the age. It's nice to know how old they were. 
But what is the reason for the Torah to have to give me that information at this point when they're going to Paro? So says the rabbi like this. Right away they came to Paro, they said, Paro, let us go and don't waste your time. Because you're not going to beat God. And he comes, oh, me Hashem, who's God? I never heard of him. Aaron says, listen, I'm 83 years old. And I want you to know I'm 83, because you did something, Paro, 83 years ago. You made a decree that the Jewish midwives, when the babies come out of the birthing canal, that you have to kill them. Do you know I was born at that time? And my mother called me Aharon, because Aharon comes from the Hebrew word Herayon. Herayon is pregnant, because she was pregnant at that time of the Gezerah. And guess what? I was born. Nobody strangled me, nobody killed me. So you don't know how to make Gezerot. Because God foiled you, Gezerah, I'm here today, 83 years old. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I also like to tell a story. But oh, I'm 80 years old. 80 years ago you made another Gezerah to throw all the babies in the water. And you were doing it to kill me. Guess what? Happy birthday, Moshe. I'm 80 years old today. It didn't work. It failed miserably, as you know. Your daughter saved me. My mother nursed me. The government paid for it. I sat, uh, right, I sat on, on your lap. I sat in the palace. You taught me education of how to be a, a ruler with the nimus, with the protocol. And therefore... Let these two lessons of our ages, 83 and 80, let that be a lesson that you're not going to succeed, so you might as well surrender now. But Paro is a ge'eh. Paro is filled with uh, uh, ge'ut, with arrogance. And therefore, no matter how much he sees he's falling, he still goes forward. Our rabbis tell us that there was the arrogance of Paro that did not let him subjugate himself to the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Paro held himself the king of Egypt. As a matter of fact, he held himself even more than that. He held himself as a deity. He called himself a god. And therefore, he doesn't see all of his shortcomings and all of his mishappenings that are happening to him. If I could give him mashal, You've heard this mashal many times, but I want to explain it now in depth. So you have a very good picture. Imagine a person is playing chess. You know the game chess? Yes, okay, good. The game is to capture the king. You capture the king, the opponent says checkmate, Checkmate is Arabic. Sheikh Mat. The Sheikh is the king. Mat is, he died. So he takes the king, he says, Sheikh Mat, and finished. Shahmat in Hebrew, they say. The Ibn Ezra wrote a book on chess. Imagine as the fellow's moving the king, he moves it to the right corner, and then he moves it to the left corner, and then he moves it to the right corner. He's moving the king, he's trying to protect the king. And all of a sudden, the king that's made out of plastic or ivory, the king turns to the player and says, Hey, you're getting me dizzy already over here. What are you moving me this way and this way? Don't you know I'm a king? This is the way you deal with a king? And the guy's laughing. What king? You're not a, you're a piece of plastic. We called you king. But you're the what kind of king are you over here? We want to play a game. So we called you a king. We made you a king. We hear you're a king. You're nothing. You're a zero. You're lifeless. You're an inanimate object. <laughs> you, because somebody whispered in your ear, hey, you're the king, now you, you think you're really a king? You're, you're nothing. Kibiyakol. Paro comes along and says, I'm the king. I guess Baruch Hu said, well, you're the king, what king? You're a chess piece. You think you're the king? It went to your head. Paro is a pawn. He's a piece on the chessboard. And just like we understand the mashal, that when the king on the chessboard would talk to us, we would say, what are you talking about a joke over here? He thinks he, he, the power is getting to his head. When Paro is saying, hey, I'm not letting the Jewish people go. Hashem sitting in the shaman, hey, I'm playing chess with you. What do you mean? Since when does the pieces talk? 
Since when does the pieces on the chessboard have an opinion? Hey, I move you this way, Paro, I move you that way. Watch. You're gonna, your daughter's gonna save uh, Moshe. You're gonna raise me. I move you like a baby. You have said that you have an opinion. This is the mashal of when they say that the life has shim moves them around like pieces of chess. The people, and it's so different today, even the, the leaders of the world today. Well, just because these guys in Iran, they come and say, oh, we're going to destroy. What are you talking about? You're a piece on the board over here. Since when did you have an opinion? You know what it's like, Lehavdil? It's like the Queen of England. They call her the Queen. Does she have powers? Does she have any rule to ledger? It's a, it's a title. It's just a protocol. And when she comes in, you have to bow, you have to stand. It's a, it's, it's a, and they made a rule in, 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 uh, in the game, in, in the UK. Anybody that comes from this uh, person, we're going to call them a king and a queen. But it's all, it's all a game, it's all a charade. But if kids are playing in the schoolyard, and the kids, okay, let's play queen and king. So I'm the king. Well, you're the king, because you said you're the king, you're the king. It means nothing. So all these people in government, they come along, oh, I'm the king. God says, there's only one king in this world. Adonai Melech, Adonai Malach, Adonai Yimloch Le'olam Ba'id. And God is the true king. Everybody else that comes along and says they're a Melech, this is a, a plastic piece. And therefore we don't take them serious. The only problem is Paro took himself seriously. That's the problem. When the chess piece really believes that he's a king, then you have a problem. That's the best because now you can really play games with him. Now you can really uh, 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 make pranks on, the, on Paro. I heard Hadush. Friday night we say Hadushim at the table. So my son, Shemesh bin Yosef, said the following Hadush, which I accepted. He said, sometimes we sometimes we don't accept. It has to be a, a valuable Hadush. This I thought was acceptable. Moshe Rabbeinu comes to Paro the first time with Aaron. What's the, what's the magic trick they do? They take the stick, they throw it on the floor, it turns it into a snake. Why? What's that? Moray Olam could have made many tricks. Take a rabbit out of a hat. Uh, you know, cut, cut somebody in half. What do you have to take a, a stick and throw it into a snake? Into a snake. So he said like this. The stick hits. The stick gives makot. Is that a right statement? Is that a correct statement? The stick gives the makot? No. The person holding the stick gives the makot... He just uses the stick. But the stick is just a tool. The stick is just an instrument. The stick doesn't have an opinion. The stick doesn't have a, 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 a mind of its own. It's controlled by a by intellect that is beyond it. Moshe Rabbeinu comes to Paro and says, Look, Moshe tells Paro, Aaron tells Paro, You're a stick. Don't forget it. You're a pawn. You're a king on a chessboard. God is using you to do what he wants to do. The problem is, you forgot that you're a stick. You think you're a nahash. You think you're a stake. You think you have powers on your own. You think you have your own uh, uh, entity. And therefore, you're going to get punished. Because the stick that thinks he's a snake, finish, you, you lost your tikkun. If Paro would have came in and said, listen, I'm only working for God. For some reason, God put me in this position over here. And uh, the, this is what he wants, obviously. So I'm only doing what Hashem wants. Finished. And he would have got Olam Abba. Paro would have been in Olam Abba and get Eden with the Jewish people. But instead, the power got to his head. And therefore God says, ah, you think you're somebody? Not only you're not somebody, but I'm going to show you how powerless you are and how foolish you are. And all your plans are going to backfire in your face. As they did. And that's why we say in Agadash al Pesach. Every single generation is another anti-Semite that's bent to destroy us. And Hashem saves us from the hands. But the Mefarshim say, When God saves us, how does He save us? With whose hands does He use? With their hands. That God brings the salvation using the hands of our enemies. The hands of Paro brought the uh, salvation to Am Yisrael. God can bring the Yeshua in many ways, but to make fun of the enemy, he uses their own hands. From their hands, from the enemy comes the Yeshua. I once said a derash on this. 
We said, we say every day in the, in the tefillah, Ki fada Adonai et Yaakob. This is talking about when God redeemed the Jewish people from Egypt. That whole beracha is Ga'al Yisrael. It's when the Jewish people were redeemed. So we say, Ki fada Adonai et Yaakob. Ug'alo miyad hazak mimenu. And he saved us from an enemy that was much stronger than us. The Egyptians were much stronger than us. But the explanation is, And he saved us from a great, great uh, uh, nation that was stronger. And the salvation came from them. They brought the salvation to us. You have to give credit to, uh, to Paro. I'm sure when they got to Har Sinai, so Moshe Rabbeinu has to make a speech. This is a big day. Just like you have an inaugural dinner. So the, the fellow gets up and says, I want to thank my mother, I want to thank my father, I want to thank my rabbis for getting me to this level over here. I'm nothing without them. So Moshe has to make a speech. So he gets up and says, of course, my, my, my father Amram, he was a Sadiq. He left this world without sins. My mother Yochevet, Eshet Hayel, look what she did for me. I also have to give a special uh, uh, token of appreciation to really somebody that without him I probably would not be here. And that's Paro, Melech Misraim. Really, he was very hospitable. He gave me a house. He gave me a bed. And Paro is turning over in his grave. He says, this guy over here, <laughs> this is, he is now giving me the credit. Of course, we have to give Paro the credit. It was Paro's hands. The Geulah comes from him. Now you understand it, Tashirat Alalti. That's the classic example. I know I didn't say any Hadushim to you yet. The Hadushim are coming. But this is just uh, so you get a classic example of the, of the boomerang of events. How not only didn't he succeed, but he was made fun of. Second example. This is from the Ben Ishai. The Ben Yosef Haim in Baghdad. In the Sefer Od Yosef Hai. He says like this. The last plague is Makat Bechorot. Also this week's parasha. What happens, Makat Bechorot? The Egyptian firstborns by this time were scared. Because when Moshe Rabbeinu announced the plague, they told their fathers, listen, we don't want to die. The fathers told them, nah, well, you're scaredy cat. Nothing's going to happen to you. Hey, Dad, Moshe Rabbeinu is nine for nine. He's batting a thousand. We don't want to take a risk now that he should get a strike, the first strike on us. Maybe he's going to be successful. We don't want to die. No, nah, don't worry about it. Dad, please, let the Jewish people go. All of a sudden, the Gemara writes a civil war broke out between the firstborns and their parents. You see what's going on in Syria today? With the civil war? Picture that happened in Egypt where there was just fighting on every single block, Egyptians killing Egyptians. Can you do Hashem? And the rabbis say more people died in that civil war between the fathers and the firstborns than in the plague itself. That God smote the Egyptians. What was the Makkah? From their firstborns. It doesn't say Limakeh Bechore Misraim. It's Limakeh Misraim. God hit the Egyptians Bibchorehim from the Bechorot. Civil war broke out. Fine. Whoever was left over, they're in the house. They're waiting for the clock to strike 12 o'clock, midnight, Hatzot. God tells the Jewish people take blood and paint it on your doors. Why? Because God says, I'm dispatching the mashit. The mashit is Satan. Any door that he sees the Pesach blood, Velo yavo hamashit el batechem lingof. The Egyptians are wondering to themselves, 
Why are the Jewish people putting this marker on their doorposts? Ah, it must be that that's, that's a sign that when the angel of death comes, they skip the house. They figured it out. They were right. They said, okay. They had an idea. They come to the Jewish people. They knock on the door. They say, listen, uh, my son, he wants to sleep over tonight. Can he sleep over? The Jewish people say, he wants to sleep over? Baruch They bring him in, Muhammad. They bring him into the, into the house over there. Maybe he'll maybe convert. Maybe we'll get him Jewish. Erev Rav. They bring him inside, he sleeps in the house. The Egyptian guy walks away, he says, these foolish Jews. We, we put him in the secured, the Ir Miklat, we put him in the protected house. And all the Egyptians did this. They went to their neighbors. Uh, do me a favor, could you take him for the night? Um, Abdullah, and this is taking uh, Farid, and all of the Egyptian uh, people over there. No problem. And guess what? The Egyptians were right. The Mashit, the Malachamavit, he passed by the house, he sees the blood, I cannot go in. The Egyptian Bechor in the bed is laughing, I beat the system, I beat the system. All of a sudden, we say in Agadash al Pesach, Ani velo malach. God says, I'm coming down into Egypt. What do you mean you're coming down? You said the Mashit is coming down. So God said, no, we're splitting it. The Mashit is going to all the Egyptian houses. But the Mashit cannot go to the Jewish houses. I'm going to all the Jewish houses to weed out all the Egyptians. And therefore, you're right, the Satan passed over the house of the Jews. But Hashkadot Baruch did not pass. He went straight into the house and he killed every single Egyptian, so nobody got saved, it backfired. He says, okay, <laughs> backfired. The next day the Egyptian says, where's my uh, baby? He says, where's your, where's your, here he gave it to him in a stretcher. Yoshev Besetter Anyon, he gave it to him in, in, in a coffin. What happened to him? What was happened to him? I, th- I thought this was protected. It's protected for Jews, not for Egyptians. But I thought it says, but don't you have one Don't worry, the Mashhid didn't come. God killed him himself. Now what happened? In the Egyptian house, the Satan comes in. Satan's looking, who's the Bechor over here? Who's the Bechor? The Egyptian guy says, there's no Bechor over here. We don't have any Bechor. Why? Why don't you have a Bechor? Every house has to have a Bechor. You're so smart. We sent the Bechor next door to the Jewish house, and you can't go there. So now you're stuck. He says, good. I'm glad you told us God gave me instructions that if there's no Bechor, we kill the next oldest one in the house. Tah! He kills the guy. So now the Egyptians got hit twice. <laughs> they got hit twice. If they would have kept the kid in the house, they lose one. But because they gave the kid to the Jewish people, they lost two. Can you have do Hashem? You see the mockery? God is making jokes on the Egyptians. It's not just he hit them. We say, Makat Bechorot. But study the Makat Bechorot, you see, he made a letzanut of them, a derision of them. And that's what the Benish Hai says, Vet ototai asher samtibam, the otot. The otot is the sign on the, on the doorpost, the blood. That was part of the joke, because they thought that the blood would protect them, but it would only protect them from Satan. Vida'atem ki ani Adonai. But they didn't realize that I am God. I don't have those same rules. I was able to go in. Not only the firstborns, but b'misrayim proper, that even the non-firstborns died because of this scheme of the, of, the, of the Egyptians. That's another classic example of it'adalti. But the interpretation that I came to say tonight is as follows. You need to go back to Parashat Noah. Noah comes out of the Teba. He's in the Teba for, uh, for a year. He's in a jungle. The Teba is a, is a zoo. All the animals. So when he came out, he wanted to make a lahayim. So he made some wine. He didn't realize how strong the wine was. 
And it says, Vayishkad, he became inebriated. He got drunk. And something happened in the tent when he was drunk, without getting into the details. But when he got sober, he realized what happened. And it says that he cursed his grandson, Kena'an. Arur Kena'an. Eved Avadim Yiyel Ehav. He said, Kena'an, you're going to be Eved Avadim. What does this mean, Eved Avadim? You want to make him an Eved? Eved, Kena'an, you become slaves. Finish. And they became slaves, Kena'an. Whoever comes from Kena'an is Eved. Go figure it out. But what does it mean when he said, Arur Kena'an, Eved Avadim, Yeyel Ehav? What does it mean, Eved Abadim? So there's a sefer that I have here. The sefer is called Bechor Shor. He says a brilliant Hadush. He says, really, not only was Kena'an cursed, but all of Kena'an's brothers were also cursed. Noah cursed all the descendants of Ham. They were cursed at what? That they're all going to be slaves. Who are they going to be slaves to? They're going to be slaves to their uncle, Shem. Shem is us, we're the Semites. But Kenan got a double curse. Eved Abadim, you're going to be a slave to the ones that are slaves. That means you're going to be a slave to your brothers and to Shem. That means Kenan is on the lowest level. Everybody else is Evid. But Kenan, Evid Avadim. His Lashon is Evid Avadim Yelehav Kedomar. Kol Banav Shelham Yeyu Avadim Levneshem. Ach Kenan Yitkalel Yoter. Leyot Evid Leehav Avadim. Now anybody know who Ham's children were that got cursed? Torah tells us who they were. Ubne Ham, Kush, Mitzrayim, Ufut, Uchna'am. I'm not talking about food tonight. Hey, Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim. Hey, we know Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim is a paro'ah. The Egyptians. That means really, Mitzrayim is our cousins. We come from Shem. Mitzrayim comes from Ham. And it was well known, this curse. There was a tradition all the way back from Noah that Mitzrayim is cursed, and the curse is they're going to become Avadim to Shem. Now all of a sudden the Jews come down to Egypt. Ubne Israel Paruva Yishretsu Vayirbuva Yatsmu Bim Odme Od Vatimale Aris Otam and the Jewish people are starting to multiply. And Paro starts to get nervous. He said, Here it comes. The curse of Noah is gonna come true in my day. These are the descendants of Shem. They're multiplying by leaps and bounds. Before you know it, they're going to rule over us. And therefore Paro was scared of the curse of Noah. Because according to Noah, Mitzrayim has to be the Evid of Shem. And he saw the writing on the world on the wall. So what does he say? We have to use Hukma. Ezu Hakam we need, to, we need to go on an offensive. Before they make us slaves, we have to make them slaves. This is what motivated Paro to put the Jewish people in slavery. He said, if I wait, I'm going to be the slave. And therefore he used black magic, kishuf, magic, sorcery, all the kohot of Tum'ah in order 
to put the Jewish people under his subjugation, and all of a sudden, they were all slaves. All the ministers go to Par'o, all the Egyptians, Hazaku Baruch. That was a close call. Wow. Imagine if you didn't act, if you were sleeping at the wheel, before you know it, we would have been slaves. And Par'o says, yeah, what is Noah? What do you think, Noah? Noah's going to beat me? You think I'm going to be the slave of these Jews over here? What does Noah know? He never met Par'o. And what's God doing in Shamayim? God's laughing. He's laughing. Keep on talking, Paro. Keep on talking, your chess piece. Keep on talking, your stick. The curse of Noah. You'll see how it's going to come on you. You know what the Torah calls Egypt? The Torah calls Egypt. Eretz Beneham. If you read the Tehillim, in chapter 105, the Pasuk says, Samu Bam Devre Ototavo Mofetim, the Eretz Ham. What is Eretz Ham? Ham is Misraim. Why do you call Misraim Eretz Ham? Because uh, Misraim is from the children of Ham. We say every night in Ve'emunah Kozot. Be'eris Ham. Oh. If you look in the Torah, Torah calls Egypt Kura Barzel. What is Kura Barzel? A Kur is a furnace. This is a furnace that's used for purifying metals. You take Barzel. What is Barzel? Iron. The iron has in it impurities. So you need to put it in the fiery furnace and the dross, the impurities of the metal are extracted. You might have to do it two, three times. And then the iron becomes pure. Egypt is called Kura Barzel. Who's the Kur? Egypt. They're the furnace. Who's the Barzel? Oh, the Jewish people. The Jewish people. What does it got to do with Kura Brazil? What does it got to do with Kura Brazil? Because the Beru Ari writes, in order for us to receive the Torah at Sinai, we needed to go through the purging and the affliction of Egypt. The Gemara says in Berachot, and the Vre Torah mit Kaimim Ela Yisurim. To get the Torah, one must go through affliction first. And there was a lot of tikkunim that had to be done. There was tikkunim from the times of Noah. There was tikkunim from the generation of the Palaga. Before the Torah can be given, there was a lot of rectification that needed to be done, Arizal says, on old souls. And until that rectification was done, there could be no ge'ulah. And therefore these nishamot would have to come down, and God would put them in the furnace of Avodat Parikh, the furnace of Egypt, and that would purify them and make them suitable for Matan Torah. That's why it's called Kur Barzel. Why isn't it called Kur Zahav? Zahav you also put in the Kur. Why isn't it called Kur Kesef? Why Kur Barzel? Because all the 12 tribes were in Egypt. The 12 tribes came from four women. Rachel and Le'ah, and Bilhah and Zilpah. Barzel is Rashi Tevot. Bilhah, Rachel, Zilpah, Le'ah. That's Kura Barzel. All the children of the Imahot, they would have to go to this furnace to purify themselves. Once the final dross came out, God said, okay, now we're ready. You can leave now. Now you're suitable to receive the Torah. 50 days from now, you're going to get the Torah. If we didn't go through Egypt, there's no direct flights to Matan Torah. You can't go from Yaakov Abinu to Hasinai. There's, no, there's a stopover. And the stopover is a 210 year layover. That's what it was. There's no other way to get there. You needed to go through Egypt. That's what Abinu Arizal says. 
the road to Matan Torah must go through Egypt. Oh no. Now think for a second. Who's the slave? Who's working for who over here? But all the whole time said, I'm the master and they're the slaves. After 210 years, the Jewish people tell Paro, thanks a lot, we're pure now. We appreciate the service. That was a good massage you gave us. All of a sudden, Paro says, where are you going? That we're going to get the Torah. Get the Torah. And the Baruch says, yeah, you made them perfect. Nobody works the kur like you, Paro. Really, you took the iron, you put it in properly, you gave the... What do you mean? This was a setup. And the Kadosh Baruch Hu says, what do you think? No curse doesn't come true? Indeed, you were the slave. You were working for Am Yisrael. You were the, giving the, the doctor. Who's the king? The patient is the king. When the doctor and the nurses, they're standing around the table, they're the avid. They're doing this, they're doing that, even though they look like the Hashuv ones. But the patient... The patient is in charge. The patient gives orders to the doctors. The doctor cannot do anything unless he gets permission from the patient. Now, even though the, pa- the doctor is cutting the patient up, but it's for his benefit. So Paro is giving makot. Oh, look at these Jewish people. Ah, I'm giving them makot, resha'im, they're my slaves. And Akash Baruch is telling Paro, they need a little more, give them more makot. You're, they're making them perfect. They have a little uh, problem over here. Tum'ah, give them another hit over there. And after it was all over, Paro says, I got duped. It was reverse. Noah was right. The descendants of Shem came into Egypt, and I worked on them for 210 years. And God says, really, Paro? You should get paid for all this work. But we're taking your money also. That's, imagine the doctor giving the whole operation. And then after this operation is finished, the doctor says, uh, the copay. Copay? Not only am I giving you the copay, but I'm taking the keys to your Rolls Royce now. I'll see you later. And he takes the, 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 the doctor's car home. Then what happened? I did all the work. You get the Rolls Royce? That's what happened in Egypt. To me, that's the biggest joke on Paro. He didn't realize that he was the biggest slave. He was doing the work that nobody else would be able to do. So when we got to Matan Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu in his speech, he says, the truth is, I, ha- I have to thank Paro not only for raising me, which, but we have to give him a special testimonial plaque on behalf of all the Jewish people, because for all his hard work in Egypt, what he did to us, not easy working the furnace. It's not easy working the, uh, the kur. And as a result, uh, he's uh, merit that we came to Matan Torah, and everybody's applauding. Hazakabaruch Paro, hey Paro, Hazakabaruch Paro, great worker. Paro says, I'm a worker. Et Hashem et Alalti b'Mitzrayim, Yosef b'Shamayim Mishag, Hashem yilag lamo. But it's a little more than what I'm telling you. The Benu Ari writes. That when Hakadosh Baruch Hu created the world. Before Adam Arishon, when Hashem was creating the Olamot, He was creating the worlds. There was upper worlds before we got to this world. Olamot beyond this world. The Ben Wari, he knew about these worlds, he talks about them. And he says how there was a Hishtal Shilut. Slowly the light came down, slowly, slowly, slowly until the light finally reached our areas. But as the light came down, it was very strong, and certain worlds weren't able to, to hold this light, and there, there was what's called the Shavira, there was a, a breaking of the Kelim. I don't want to go into the details, but this is a very important Yisodot, and how the world came about. Anyway, when this light shattered like explosions, eventually the light came down to this world, but when these explosions happened, 
a lot of the ore got dispersed. And the job of Am Yisrael is to return all these lights back to the original place. And the Beruari tells us how many lights got dispersed. How many? No. Rapah. Rapah. Nitzotzim or Nitzotzot. Rapah is 288. They say, what's that? I told you, Eddie, nothing. A couple, a couple, a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of uh, 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 volts, a couple of watts. You know, a 288 watt bulb. How much is that? No, these are big orot. And the whole goal of this world is scavenger hunt. And there's one thing on the list: rapa nitzotzot. Once we collect all the rapas, we put them back where they're supposed to be. The kelim are fixed. The or comes down. Mashiach is here, and that's it. We're finished. How do, you, how, do you, how do you recover Nitzotzot? Making Berachot, learning Torah, doing every prayer, prayer that we make, and make a Tikkun on another Nitzot. Now, not the only Nitzot, but a piece of it, a millionth of it. So with all the Jewish people, all their service, Be'azat Hashem, we'll get to it. Why we come here on Thursday night? Must be during the great Shavira, some of those Nitzotzot landed in this room. And therefore God in His infinite wisdom brought Jews to this neighborhood and put in our mind to come to this exact location on Thursday night to say Torah in order that we should lift Nitzotot Shul Kedushah. Once we collect everything in the area, and that's it, we move on to another place. There's nothing to collect. The scavenger hunt has to move on to a different location. But right now we're doing great tikkun in this place by studying Torah. This is not a coincidence why Hashem brings us to this Makom Kadosh. Now, does anybody have any idea how many Nitzotzot of the Rapah do we have left? How many have we recovered? That's my question. You are very smart, all of you, for not answering. Because... How could you answer this question? You never even heard of the Rapah Nitzotzot. Now you're going to be an expert how many we have left. You just learned about it eight seconds ago. Now already you're going to become a maven to tell me how many we did, how many we didn't. You say, Rabbi, these are deep stuff over here. I'm not, I'm not going to go into the lion's den with you on this. Rabbeinu Ari writes that in Egypt we collected 202. Wow. <laughs> Beautiful. So the large majority of the Rapah is already put back in place. When we left Egypt, the Pasuk says, Vegam Erev Rav ala Imam. They call him Erev Rav. Rav is Resh Bet. Resh Bet is 202. That we got Rav, we got 202 Nitzotzot when we came out. That's why when Yaakov Abinu tells his, bro- his children to go down to Egypt, he says them to go down and get food. Yaakov needs food. Yaakov, why? He wants some uh, Egyptian uh, uh, food in Damas. What does he want from Egypt? If you look at the language of Yaakov Abinu, he says, Lishbor bar. Go down to get the bar. Bar is 202. Go down to start the process of Rapah Nitzotzot. Lishbor bar. Bring the 202. What does Yaakov Abinu say when he finds out Yosef is still alive? He says, Rav! Oh, Yosef Beni Hai. He says, my son is still alive. That means we can make tikkun, Rav. We can make the tikkun over here. Paro says it. Hine am Yisrael, Rav ve'atsum. Rav. All, you see this word Rav ten, ten times in the, in, in the story. Because that's what they did. The truth of the matter is, we could have done the whole tikkun in Egypt. But if we would have stayed in Egypt another second, we would have fallen to a lower level. So we had to get out. We could not stay. So basically, we have 86 left. Now, I have to assume that in, if in Egypt, which was 3,000 years ago, 
we were at 202 in 3,000 years all the Jewish people they're talking about now the Tanaim, the Amoraim the, the Nevi'im from before a lot of Tikkunim so again I don't know the answer to this question but it's fair to say that we're at the end of the end of the Rapa we just got a few more uh, to go and then we're basically done. If in 210 years in Egypt they did 202, and that's what it means, the Rechush Gadol that they came out, which was the, the, the Rav Nitzotzot. And all this is hinted, by the way, on page one of the Torah. This Rav Haim Vital says from his rabbi. The Pasuk says, when God created the world, so there was the, the breaking of the Kelim, which is the Rapa, the 288. So the Pasuk says, Elohim And the Spirit of God was hovering. Says Rabbeinu Ari, if you take the word Merachefet, Merachefet, what's the middle letters of Merachefet? Resh Hepet. Resh Hepet. Rapa. And what's the outer letters? Merachefet, Mem, Taf. So he says, when God created the world, Met Rapa. The Rapach fell. There was a destruction. However, he says, Viruah, when the spirit of Mashiach comes, Viruah Elohim. Elohim is how much? 86. 86. Viruah Elohim Mirachefet. When Mashiach comes, the Elohim from the Rapach met is going to be finished. And that's it, then we'll have tikkun. So already the instructions of what we're supposed to do is on page one right in the beginning. Already it loots to us in Menachefer, already it hints to us in how many we have left over. So at the end in Galut America, or Galut Edom, I don't even know if it's 86, because we had already two, three Galuyot, three Galuyot since then. So I'm sure they collected some, ex- some, some in this. No exile was more beneficial to Am Yisrael in Tikkun Olam than Egypt. We collected most of the, uh, of the things on the list, on the scavenger hunt in Egypt. To whose credit? Paro. And therefore, Paro thought that he's enslaving us. Meanwhile, the more he enslaved us, the more he enslaved us, there there was no Torah, we couldn't make berachot. The way we got the Rapah in Egypt was from Yisurin, from the affliction, from the tsar of the Galut, that was able to purify us, and we collected. And therefore I say, who was working for who? Paro was working for us. Paro gave us the opportunity to purify ourselves from Matan Torah and to collect the large majority of the Nitzotzot that would prepare us for Mashiach. So that was the third thing Moshe Rabbeinu said in his speech when he got to Matan Torah. He said, not only do I have to thank him for raising me, not only do I have to thank him for putting us through the Kura Barzel, he's a very good Kura operator, Paro. He did a very, a very good job. We appreciate all his hard work. Not easy running the kud. And we also have to thank him. Look at how hospitable he was. Because of Paro, we came out with Rav. We came out with Bar. We came out with 202 Nitzotzot Shul Kiddushah. So we just have a little more uh, to go. He has the Guinness Book of World Records. The most Nitzotzot in any country is Paro. Hazagabaruk to Paro. And Paro is saying, I don't want you to thank me for any of these things over here. I didn't have kavanah to save Moshe. I didn't have kavanah for Matan Torah. Oh, the Rav Nitzotzot. And God says, et asher et alalti v'mitzrayim. You're coming along and saying, I'm a king. Mi Hashem, 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 Who's God? And what I'm spinning him like a top. He's making a derision and a, and a, and a flitzanut and a foolishness. Out of it. This is the way you're supposed to tell over the story to your children. Not only the storyline, but you have to find in the story itself, how HaKadosh Baruch Hu uses the Rasha in order to show that only HaKadosh Baruch Hu is ilat ta'ilot v'sibat ta'sibot, that only God is running the world. 
and nobody's will means anything, and not only won't he succeed, but it'll backfire, and the result will be the exact opposite that he intended, like we see in these cases. I'm smart not to answer that question also. These are secrets of Hashem. Who knows what we have left? Who knows what we don't have left? But what it's written is we collect the drab. I'm sure there was big tikkunim in that generation as well. But if Mashiach didn't come yet, that means there's still some on the bottom of the... For us, the Musar is... At the end of time, there's going to be a great awakening that we're living through now. Because once the tikkunim have almost finished, so Borei is going to expedite it. Today we see many ba'ale teshuvah. Teshuvah is to return. What are we returning? To return the nitzotzot. To return the rapa. That's teshuvah. To return them back to the original place. So what who says, uh, uh, now uh, there's uh, towards the end of the, uh, the barrel, mo shi'urim, mo hasadim, mo tefilot, so we're part of a tremendous moment of history. Unfortunately, it seems, however, that it's sometimes you take three steps forward and then one step back. I have to assume that because of Averot, sometimes the Nitzotzot are able to fall back down. So we just have to pray for the day where there's a surge of observance in Am Yisrael, where we can just get them all in the box, where they hit all the root, and then the good news is that just like we came out of Misraim, which is the paradigm of all Galuyot, will be fulfilled in us. Miyitain misiyon, Yeshua'at Yisrael, Veshuv Adonai Shevut Amo, Yagel Yaakov Yisma'a Yisrael, Amen ve'amen. Be Hananya Brakashamir, 